Hi everyone, it's James from Community Legal Centres Queensland here. Welcome to another one of our um, exciting webinars for 2017. This one looking at sham employment contracts. Um, can I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today? Um, Brendan, our presenter, and I are south of the Brisbane River, so we acknowledge the Yagara people as the traditional custodians of this land. The Turrbal people are the traditional custodians north of the river. Um, and given that people are tuning in from across the country, I um, acknowledge that uh, we all live on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land, um, pay our respects to elders and ancestors and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. I'll take care of a couple of ha housekeeping things before handing over to Brendan Pearce, our presenter, to talk about the, uh, the important area of sham employment contracts. Um, we are hoping to make a recording of this webinar available on our website and we'll email it around We'll send an email around confirming that, subject to the technology working. In the last half hour or so, I've emailed around a copy of Brendan's PowerPoint presentation um, to people who have registered by then. Should also be able to access it on the handouts area of the GoToWebinar control. So you can hold your questions over to the end. That would probably be our preferred option. But if you do have a pressing or urgent question, uh, press that button that looks like a hand or type question into the questions box. Um, I think that's my housekeeping kind of stuff out of the way. So can I introduce Brendan Pierce, who's a lawyer with uh, Colin Biggers Paisley um, and specialising in employment law, who's here to present to us today on um, an area of practice that does come up uh, reasonably often in com uh, community legal centres where um, a person is engaged to perform work uh, and it, it appears that the employer or, um, or principal is trying to uh, set up or structure the relationship um, to escape some of their liabilities as employer. Uh, comes up surprisingly often in community legal centre practice. Uh, so it's great to have Brendan here today and just bear with us while we swap chairs around. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and you'll have to uh, take time with me. It's my first ever webinar, and so I'm just getting used to the way the, the facilities here work. Uh, I've been invited in today, obviously by the CLC, to talk about sham contracting, um, or in particular, sham employment contracts, um, and specifically three main areas that I'll, that I'll be looking to discuss. Uh, first of all, uh, how to identify a sham arrangement. Secondly, how to assist employees to assert their rights. And thirdly, uh, how to obtain unpaid entitlements uh, for uh, as an employee or uh, in most instances people on mine today uh, in, their, in their role as a, a volunteer or an employee of, of a legal centre across the country. So uh, without further ado, we may as well commence. Uh, the first uh, key to identifying a sham arrangement is, is knowing exactly what a sham arrangement is. Uh, a sham contract is when an employer and a is when an employer or labels themselves as a principal uh, and de deliberately disguises an employment relationship as an independent con contracting arrangement. Uh, in, in many instances, uh, it will still be a sham contracting arrangement if the uh, employer or principal hasn't deliberately done so, but has done so accidentally, uh, or, or that it finds uh, under the Fair Work Act may not apply in such circumstances. Uh, Individuals who are working as contractors or subcontractors uh, will often be denied the same entitlements as an employee, uh, and, and that, that's obviously the interest for employers in, in setting up these arrangements. Uh, and, and quite often, uh, the the main area, the, the, the most obvious sign of a sham contracting arrangement uh, will be when uh, an, an employer uh, can will ask an employee to. Uh, essentially resign and then re-sign re re the employee a contractor arrangement or re-sign different employees under that arrangement. Uh, so 
the key to identifying a sham arrangement Just having a technical issue at the moment. I apologise. Should be good. It should be good. Uh, so the key to identifying a sham arrangement is obviously to understand uh, how working relationships in Australia uh, operate and exist. Uh, so there's there's usually two types of working relationships. That there can be others, uh, but specifically you'll have you'll find employees and contractors uh, in, in the as the main types of working relationships in Australia. Uh, the courts have set up um, a number of principles and, and what they call the key indicia uh, that they use to differentiate between the types of working relationships. And it's not always clear um, initially when you look at a, a working relationship whether or not someone would be classified as an employee uh, or, or, a, or a contractor. And, and uh, quite often, or in many instances, these cases um, are, are disputed and, and have gone all the way to the High Court and uh, continue to do so. Uh, the, the, as I said earlier, the telltale sign uh, in relation to people who may come into a community legal centre uh, would be where they're, where an employee or a worker has been dismissed and asked to, to get an ABN or where they've uh, been offered a position with a company uh, but the, uh, the basis or, or, or in order to, up, to take up that position, they have to get an ABN uh, to do so. And obviously in, in different industries this can be more common and, and less common. Um, typically the more qualified uh, or expert individual is in their field, uh, the, the less likely a, a contracting arrangement may be in some instances to be a sham, although not always. Um, but specifically in, in industries such as um, lower paid industries such as uh, care, care industries and service industries, the cleaning industry, uh, there, there's been a number of instances where employees have been coaxed into uh, these sham contracting arrangements uh, by, by employers who have sought to uh, set themselves out as a principal contractor uh, and encourage employees to take out an ABN or, or an ACN uh, in order to uh, con conduct the working arrangement. Uh, so, uh, as an overview, the, the two main types of or the two main areas uh, under which Australians will work uh, will be employees and contractors. They're classified as workers, and that definition of workers is important for WHS legislation, uh, which in many instances may not. Uh, differentiating obligations uh, specifically between employees and contractors uh, or employers and contractors. Uh, as a brief definition, uh, an employee usually, and, and these are some of the key indicators that the courts will look at, uh, will usually be someone that provides their labour. Uh, they'll be engaged in a manner that is full-time, part-time or casually. They've got duties to uh, an employer such as uh, fidelity of good faith and uh, it's, it's arguable as to where a contractor does have those duties. Uh, typically employees will have less control over how they work, when they work or where they work. Uh, they're purely or, or quite often taking instructions specifically from their employer uh, and, and, that, and that's the basis of their relationship. And uh, the, the, the crux of the entitlements for employees is uh, the Fair Work Act or State Industrial Relations Act, Superannuation Act, work cover and, and other acts that give employees a specific uh, level of entitlements uh, which which the the role of the sham contract is to remove uh, that entitlement quite often. So the, the, the key difference between a, an employee and a contractor is an employee, a contractor is running their own business uh, and, and has to be seen to be doing so in the way that they're engaged uh, by the principal. So they're quite often hired to provide a service or a result. Uh, they're, they're running a business separate from the business that hires it. That is, they're not completing tasks for the purpose of, of satisfying another business. They're completing the tasks for their own business. Uh, and, and that can be, and that's probably the key to identifying a real contractor, uh, if there is one area above others. Typically contractors uh, will have a, a high level of independence and freedom and uh, principal will have little or no control over how the work is performed or 
when the work is performed uh, unless it's contractual. Uh, typically, a, a contractor is uh, work, working for their own business uh, and completely autonomous in, in that working environment um, where that's possible. So the, the key area for contractors or, or another area is the fact that contractors are typically responsible for their own work. Um, they don't have vicarious liability, which is something we'll talk about later when we look at some of the cases. Uh, and they uh, typically will be able to engage other, empl other employees or all contractors to perform the work that they've contracted to do. Uh, so, if, 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 and this is something that comes up a, a bit uh, when you're looking at sham contracting arrangements is that quite often people are engaged on a contract but they're not able to uh, subcontract that the work to someone else and, and that can be an area the courts will look at. And, and it's never a simple fa uh, fact of, of saying this person is definitely an employee or, or, or a contractor where these uh, sub where, where, where these where the principals or an employer has sought to uh, enliven a contractual arrangement. Uh, independent contractors do have some entitlements or uh, benefits under the law and, and they're covered generally by the Independent Contractors Act, the Corporations Act, uh, the Competition and Consumer Act uh, and then also some areas of the Fair Work Act as well. So it, it's not as though contractors are necessarily uh, specifically not covered by legislation, it's just they have different entitlements and different obligations and quite often in these sham contracting arrangements people will be brought in without understanding who uh, or, or what their entitlements are as a contractor, what their obligations are, what their duties are uh, and so that can be why it's so dangerous. Obviously employees uh, entitlements have uh, been passed under a series of different acts of, of, of the parliament and uh, set up by probably over 100 years of industrial disputes in Australia. Uh, so those, those entitlements generally will include superannuation, uh, which typically a, a contractor would not be uh, would not have to be accessible to. Long service leave, it's different in each state, but generally after uh, around 10 years of service, an employee is in, entitled to a period of time off. You've got workers' compensation, uh, which in the case of a contractor, they may be required to take out their own independent insurance. Uh, unfair dismissal legislation, uh, specifically the Fair Work Act or a SAFE uh, Act, which will protect an employee from being removed from their employment. Uh, and this can be one of the key areas that a, a sham contract arrangement will be seeking to avoid. Uh, obviously, the other area would be leave, so annual and pers pers personal leave. Contractors are not entitled to paid leave. Uh, they don't have, uh, quite often they don't have an availability for collective bargaining, although in some industries it can be quite prevalent that they are involved in collective bargaining to some extent. Uh, obviously on wages and overtime, uh, another element of, a, of an employee's entitlements that a contractor typically wouldn't have. Uh, and, and so looking at how a contractor is paid can be key to determining whether or not uh, the contractor is in fact an employee uh, who has been engaged in the sham contracting arrangement. Uh, the last area and, and is, is vicarious liability, and this will come up in a case we're going to look at shortly, Hollis and Barbu, uh, whereby uh, typically uh, an employee, an employer is liable for the acts or omissions of an employee's, uh, provided those acts or omissions have taken place in the course of employment. And, and so this is one area where uh, quite a, where it, will, it may come to a head. But typically, these sham contracting arrangements. Uh, they're, they're quite prevalent uh, in, in Australia and, and they don't come to a head for various reasons. In many instances, the, the contractors are more than happy uh, to be contracted in the way that they are for whatever reason. They, it may suit the way they work. They like the independence or the flexibility uh, or they may believe they're, they're getting paid a higher rate of pay to be in a, a contractual arrangement. Uh, but when it comes down to who's liable uh, for for someone being injured or, or for an accident or for damage to property, uh, vicarious liability becomes pretty important uh, in and determining whether someone is in, typically an employee or a contractor uh, becomes far more important and far more uh, useful in terms of the money it can save either side. So the, the courts have set out uh, that 
that they prefer to take the totality approach, uh, which whereby no, uh, none of the key indicators on this page on their own uh, will specifically uh, define someone or, or, or lead the courts to determine that someone is an employee or, an empl or a contractor. Uh, what they do is they, they add all these, and, and, and there can be many more than, than what I've broken down on this page, um, they'll add elements of the relationship or the working relationship between the, the principal and the contractor or, or the employer and the employee uh, and then come to a cumulative uh, decision based on um, obviously the cumulative outcome of, of the various assessments they make under these areas. And, and so typically you'll hear uh, uh, the courts talking about control and, and, and they'll look, go and look at areas like the hours of work, how the job is done. Uh, in some instances, the conduct uh, of an employee and, and whether uh, the principal seeks to have control over that conduct, uh, whether the employee or the con or the principal, or the, sorry, the contractor uh, is given direction as to how to do work, the level of supervision. They'll look at other areas too. So, for instance, the provision of uniforms, uh, tools, training, procedures and policies, superannuation. These are signs uh, whereby if a, if a a contractor has been provided these items, it might be a sign that the contractor is actually not performing work for their own business but working for someone else's business. And then they'll look at other areas of the relationship. So employee records, and, and this can be one of the key areas because typically an, a, an employer who's seeking to uh, flout these laws uh, will not keep records or have reduced records. Uh, the other things they'll look at are behavioural duties of the employee or the contractor the reporting duties of the employee or the contractor, the personal performance, whether or not, as we discussed, uh, it's available to the employee or the contractor to uh, subcontract that work to someone else. They'll also look at the wording of, of the engagement and contract uh, and any other policies and procedures that may be relevant. And they'll look at the tax arrangements. Uh, and they can be, uh, cumulatively, there can be significantly advantages for uh, an employer to disguise their relationship uh, as a principal and quite often that is why they do it and uh, they would do so on, on the basis quite often that, that the employee who is engaged to the contractor also may feel as though they're in a better position as a result of the relationship, uh, but they, that may not necessarily be so. Uh, so there are benefits, of it, as we just discussed, to being an employee or to being a contractor or an employee. Typically you'll find uh, that contractors uh, will uh, espouse the fact that they've been contracted. They've, they have the ability to subcontract that work out. They can create goodwill uh, through their work as an individual and their work a, as a business. They might even be able to take on uh, employees uh, in, in their business as they begin to grow. And, and so uh, if you are a contractor, I guess the key is to be treating it uh, or for an individual to be in a situation where they're treating their, their working life as, a, as, a, as though they're running a business. Uh, and, and building a business, and they um, things like intellectual property. Uh, when you're an employee, you typically sign away rights to that uh, in, a, in an employment contract. Uh, you would expect, as a contractor, you wouldn't be doing that, and, and it can be quite an opportunity to be engaged as a contractor. Uh, and, and so that's why it's so important uh, that the, I suppose the courts do identify instances where the contracting arrangement is a sham, uh, and, and instances where it isn't a sham and that a person who uh, is able, is running their own business and, and does seek to build that business and, it, and isn't working on behalf of someone else is, is able to do so. Uh, so one of the, if, if you're talking about tr true contractors as we discussed, um, you'll see that they're running their own business, they, they're advertising that, they might be advertising that business, they might wear their own uniforms, they might not. Uh, you wouldn't expect them to be wearing another company's uniforms, although Obviously, these things are never definite. Generally, a contractor will own their own tools or, or devices, and they, they might be uh, experts or specialists in their fields, uh, or, for instance, tradesmen or professionals. They have uh, a lot of control over uh, when, where, and how they work, um, depending on the on, on the industry they work in. Um, they may have less control uh, due to regulations and other areas. Uh, they have a contract for services. Um, quite often they'll be paid on the basis of results uh, as, as opposed to uh, the time period under which they're, they're serving an employer. 
Uh, they'll generally be assumed to be two uh, by the courts. So it'll be assumed that the contractual arrangement they've entered into with the employer, or with the with the principal, sorry, uh, is, is made on the basis of, of two equal parties making that contract. Where uh, quite often in employment relationships, it's assumed uh, there's a, a subordinate relationship between an employee and an employer. Uh, typically, contractors will be invoicing uh, the company or the principal on a monthly or, or fortnightly basis for the work that they're doing. Uh, and, and they will they have the ability to employ their own staff to do the work that they're contracted to do. The sham contracting protections uh, are available um, under state and, and federal legislation. So section 357 of the Fair Work Act sets out uh, that an employer a, a, a person that employs or proposes to employ an individual must not represent to the individual that the contract of employment under which the individual is or would be employed by the employer is a contract for services. Uh, which the individual performs or would perform work as an independent contractor. So that's the, the, the obvious uh, section of the Act there that our, uh, outlaws for engaging someone in a sham contracting arrangement. Uh, section 358 refers to the situation where an employer uh, will dismiss or threaten to dismiss someone, uh, an employee, and then attempt to re-engage them uh, as an independent contractor. Uh, and then if you look at 359, person that employs or is any time employed individual to perform work must not make a statement that the employer knows is false in order to persuade or influence the individual to enter into a contract for services under which the individual will perform as an independent contractor the same or substantially the same work as an employer. And so that's essentially 359 related to uh, coaching and voting employees in, into that relationship. Uh, the Queensland Act, and, and I'll talk specifically about the, the 2016 Act, uh, which, which will be coming in the beginning of March. Sections 302, 303, and 304 are where you can find uh, the sham contracting clause in, in relation to the Queensland Industrial Relations Act. Uh, and if we go now to Hollis and Babu, this is probably the, the most important Australian case in relation to classifying employees um, as contractors. And, and it was a, it's a case related to the vicarious liability. Um, Mr. Hollis was a bicycle courier. Uh, he got hit by an unidentified person while he was working uh, for Babu. They uh, appeared to have a, a contractual arrangement whereby uh, Mr. Hollis was running his own business and, as a contractor and, and delivering items around the city. Uh, and, and in that, I, I suppose the, the courts first of all espoused vicarious liability, uh, um, noting that in the instances of an employment relationship, uh, Babu would be uh, liable for uh, the injury that occurred to Hollis, uh, whereas if, if it was an independent contracting arrangement, uh, Hollis wouldn't be able to uh, seek damages from Babu. So it, it came down to who was going to be responsible for the injuries that Hollis had suffered. And in, in this case, uh, which is generally considered to be the, the iconic uh, Australian case, although there are others that have made the High Court and, and, and can be relevant as well. Uh, the High Court noted things such as the low level of skill uh, required to, to be a bicycle courier, um, the, the very little control over which the bicycle couriers engaged by Babu had uh, over how they performed their role, uh, when they performed their role. Um, there was another area where the, the bicycle couriers were wearing uniforms given to them by Babu. Uh, and, and this was seen to be an indication, uh, or, or one another indication, that the, the couriers were working on behalf of Babu rather than running their own businesses. And they were obviously building goodwill through that uniform uh, when they were dropping parcels off and, and picking parcels up. They, was, they appeared to be doing so as Babu rather than as their own independent contract or own independent businesses that they were uh, allegedly running. Uh, there was also noted that um, there were other areas of the employment, of, of the relationship that pointed towards the employees, in this case, being uh, independent contractors. Uh, but as we as mentioned before, the, the totality uh, principles that have been set up by the, by the High Court, a decision was made uh, that these, the Hollis in this instance, was actually an employee rather than a contractor. Uh, and, and this was despite the fact that uh, Hollis 
had had used his own bicycle to to conduct his what was allegedly his own business uh, and repaired the bicycle himself. And, and so this was quite a controversial case because it, um, there were, there were a number of instances where uh, the the key indicators the court looked at when both uh, the favour of there being a contractual relationship and favour and favour of there being an employment relationship, uh, but but overall the High Court determined that this, despite uh, the contractual arrangement, was actually a, a relationship between a, an employer and an employee, and it's an important case uh, because it it, I, it sets out that you can't, uh, as a, a regardless of what the con of what a contract between two people might say. The courts will look at what the contract actually is, uh, and, and what it actually, what how it's actually functioning on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than the wording of the contract solely. Uh, so, the next part of the presentation uh, relates to asserting rights as, as a, an employee or someone who may have uh, potentially been, or potentially be in a sham contracting arrangement. There's a, a number of different ways in which uh, an individual worker might do so. Uh, obviously, you have trained trade unions. Um, some people in some industries aren't able to be or, or willing to be covered by a trade union. Uh, and for that instance, uh, the Fair Work Act sets up the Fair Work Ombudsman, who, who we'll talk about shortly. But uh, Fair Work Ombudsman probably should be or, or could be a first port of call uh, for many people in these circumstances uh, because of the way in which it conducts itself uh, and the duties it has under the Act. Uh, Quite often, people will get confused between the Fair Work Ombudsman and the Fair Work Commission, uh, and so I guess if you're running a CLC or, or, or working in a CLC or volunteering in a CLC, the most important uh, em employment contact you can have, and I'll go into greater detail of this, is the Fair Work Ombudsman, uh, as they're able to investigate um, these types of arrangements, they're able to prosecute employers, and, and, and they do regularly. Uh, obviously, individual workers can always make applications um, to the courts. Or, or, or a community service, or a community legal service might do the same. Uh, and then the most obvious, I guess, event, uh, other area would be simply discussing it with an employer. Uh, it may be that an employer isn't aware um, that, that they're potentially in a sham arrangement. There, there's a lot of interest there for an employer not to be uh, engaging employees in this way because the fines are quite significant, uh, um, as well as the damages. Uh, where, where if it were to go wrong, so obviously if, if an employee or someone who feels that they may be an employee but being in a sham contract arrangement does wish to assert their rights, they can do so by talking to their employer and talk uh, about some of the protections that are available to them in that circumstance as well. Uh, so going directly onto that, there is a general protection and uh, in relation to um, a workplace right. So if a, if an employee or or a person generally does uh, risk to raise a, a, an issue or a complaint in relation to an area over which they have a workplace right, such as uh, not to be sham contracted, then they've got a general protection under Section 340 of the Fair Work Act, uh, and that means that an employer or, or anyone for that matter cannot take adverse action against them uh, for doing so. So, what is a workplace right for the purposes of this? Um, presentation. I think it's safe to assume uh, that you know any inquiry or, or complaint in real, about sham, sham contracting uh, will come under the heading of a workplace complaint. Uh, it's always important that it, if an employee does or is seeking to uh, make a complaint in relation to this area, that they do so in writing, uh, so that there's a record of the complaint uh, down the track if, if adverse action is taken or, or for whatever reason. Uh, obviously, adverse action on behalf of uh, an employee or, or of an employer, uh, you, most obvious example would be dismissal. Uh, so in the case of an employee raising an issue or, or attempting to assert his rights in relation or his or her rights in relation to sham contracting, uh, an, employer might, an employee might raise uh, with, with their boss or their employer uh, that they feel as though there may be a sham contracting arrangement uh, in the way in which they're engaged. and uh, Adverse action might be that an employer deciding to dismiss that employee uh, on the basis of having brought, of having raised that complaint. There can be other types of adverse action as well, um, demotion or lack of promotion. Um, the person might be relocated. There could be an internal transfer. 
Uh, there might be changes in the in the work type or the quality that they're provided. Uh, they might be sidelined within the workplace uh, or potentially constructively dismissed. So broadly speaking, any negative effect on, on an employment relationship by an employer doing or not doing something or having or not having something done. So it, it, it's a broad area of law and the protections are there if an employee does seek to assert their rights. Uh, and if you're working in a, a, a community legal centre, it, it should always be something you consider whether or not, uh, rather than going to the ombudsman or court to the courts, whether the best or the most practical solution would be to go directly to the employer or, or, or the principal who, who may be the employer. Uh, in relation to flow or the Fair Work Ombudsman, they've also got inspectors uh, who are out uh, conducting their own investigations and inquiries into working relationships and performing the functions of the Ombudsman under the Act. Uh, they can act on tip-offs, uh, so uh, I believe there's a telephone number oh, there is here on the slide where, whereby uh, anonymously uh, an employee or, or someone in one of these sham arrangements may be able to tip off the inspector. It doesn't necessarily guarantee they will come and inspect or investigate that, but, uh, but the, 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 it is a possibility. Uh, they have rights under the Act to enter premises and search or inspect records. Uh, and obviously the, the first port of, port of call for information uh, will be the Fair Work Ombudsman and, and the website there. So how to obtain unpaid entitlements. The, the two that we're going to talk about today would be specifically related to um, community legal services uh, or the Fair Work Ombudsman. So community legal services, as uh, many people online are aware, uh, can provide services for employees or, or people in sham contracting arrangements who have been dismissed or offered independent contracts uh, of employment rather than under a sham arrangement or where they've been bullied into entering an independent contract. Uh, obviously contacting community legal services seeking advice, guidance and support about the next step. The other option, uh, obviously, and, and for CLC employees as well, is if you're not sure or you need more information, uh, it, it might be suitable to, or decided that you contact the Fair Work Ombudsman. They've got an information line. They provide uh, information and advice under the Act uh, that can be relied upon. Uh, they'll put that uh, advice quite often into writing wherever they can. And so if if you're working in or volunteering in a CLC and obviously you're coming across a variety of different areas of law and uh, issues arising from you know, right across family to criminal to employment law, uh, the, the, probably the best way to get information and advice uh, so, so as to not have to specifically know such a broad area of law but in relation to employment law would be the Fair Work Ombudsman. Uh, so the, the Ombudsman is created by Part 5 2 of the Fair Work Act. Uh, set out specifically there um, two functions to promote harmonious, proactive and cooperative workplace relations and to promote uh, compliance with this act of Fair Work Instruments. Uh, in, in layman's terms, the Fair Work Ombudsman enforces the compliance of the Fair Work Act uh, and related legislation. Uh, and awards and registered agreements. It helps uh, employers and employees by providing advice and education uh, on everything from, from pay rates to dismissals uh, to workplace conditions. It provides um, reliable and timely information. And, and when I say reliable, uh, uh, we've, we've contacted them before and, and they will give you advice in writing that um, you, know, you can seek to rely on in, in, in those instances. They also have education programs and their websites um, are well of information for anyone who uh, is, is looking to clarify their working arrangement or, or other rights or obligations um, that they may have as an employee or a contractor. Um, the, the Fair Work Ombudsman is there uh, to resolve workplace issues. Um, so quite often what they will do in a circumstance where someone uh, may, may report or allege that there's a sham contracting arrangement, the Ombudsman will quite often contact the employer or, or the principal in that instance uh, and, and, and seek to organise a mediation or a conciliation uh, between all the parties to discuss what the issues may be. Uh, and, and, and so in that way, they're really going to court or, or um, conducting a proceeding under a sham contracting arrangement only occurs uh, if the employer or the principal is not willing to uh, effectively change their practices. So it's more about compliance 
uh, and rather rather than punishment in the way they operate. Although that, as we'll see later in the presentation, they they do prosecute, uh, and the penalties that they seek can be extremely high, uh, even in relation to uh, the injury suffered to an employee under a sham arrangement. Uh, it's important to know what Fair Work Ombudsman doesn't do, uh, and they they don't investigate unfair dismissal. Uh, or unlawful termination applications, uh, which are not relevant to sham contracting, but but maybe relevant to people uh, working or volunteering in a CLC. Uh, they won't investigate bullying or harassment. Again, that's the commission, and, and they can't make changes to legislation, awards, or registered agreements. Uh, other rights that the people may have in, in obtaining their unpaid entitlements, uh, they they might be able to commence proceedings, uh, although it can be quite complicated uh, to do so. Uh, and, and you probably wouldn't recommend someone does does so uh, without knowing what they're doing. Uh, they might be able to, an individual uh, might be able to seek uh, a mediation uh, to try and resolve the dispute uh, in relation to a sham contracting arrangement. Uh, Flo can, or Fair Work Ombudsman can assist in, in doing this as well. Uh, and then obviously there, there may be a settlement uh, whereby the parties might agree that there, there has been some uh, there, there is a opportunity to resolve the issue by way of a deed, and, and this is not uncommon as well in employment law matters. Uh, although, how relevant it might be to sham contracting uh, is another question. So, there's a, a few cases here that I want to discuss. Uh, probably the most uh, relevant or the, or the most current would be uh, the the Uber case in the UK, uh, and I'll get to that shortly. Uh, I'd just like to talk first of all about uh, the Fair Work Ombudsman and, and Joe in investment because this was specifically uh, a, a sham contracting arrangement that, that had been set up. Uh, Joe in investment uh, was a uh, had a contractor agreement with with people who were later found to be employees to do cleaning. Uh, so it, it was found by the by the court, the federal court, that Joe in and its owner deliberately underpaid uh, its employees. Uh, the employee specifically in this case was a, a South Korean national uh, who had been underpaid $1,858 uh, to work as a cleaner. He was particularly vulnerable because of his uh, poor low English skills. Uh, he was working here on a holiday visa uh, and the uh, Joe In had, had induced uh, this individual to uh, participate in a sham contracting arrangement by uh, setting up, a, assisting him in setting up an ABN. Uh, so he worked part time at night. They were paying him twelve dollars a twelve dollars fifty an hour under the contract. Uh, had he been working under a, the, the modern award rate, it would have been nineteen dollars sixty five an hour. So they were there were significant uh, financial incentives for Joe in to be engaging. Uh, this, this man in this way, uh, and so being a vulnerable individual that he was, uh, uh, he was unable to assert his rights uh, until eventually Fo uh, uncovered the breach after it conduct, was conducting a, a general audit uh, of the cleaning industry. Uh, and so if it weren't for that, that audit, they wouldn't have come across this circumstance. What's interesting here is that the the, the man, uh, the South Korean national was only, uh, because of the arrangement was caught relatively quickly, was only uh, underpaid $1,858. Uh, however, uh, the, the judge in the matter imposed a $55,000 penalty on the cleaning business. Uh, so it, it, it's quite a significant penalty and it, it, in the instance of the, of the South Korean national, the, the penalty far outweighed uh, any injury or, or loss to him or his entitlements. Uh, and so that's why it's so important uh, or, or it's, that these arrangements are, uh, that employees do raise these arrangements with their employers because that quite often uh, employers who, who are in a sham contracting situation may not be aware of it uh, or they uh, may not understand the extent to which uh, the, the penalties may be imposed upon them by the courts. And, and just generally the, uh, the, the penalties available are, are quite significant and there has recently been uh, 
in the court an area where employers or where the courts have specifically um, threatened legal advisors who are assisting clients in entering into these arrangements. So, uh, for instance, lawyers who are assisting or encouraging their clients to uh, engage people on a contractual basis, uh, as a, where, where it's quite obvious that they should be employees, uh, it, it's available to the courts uh, under the Fair Work Act to, to essentially uh, include those advisors in their applications uh, when, when, when they're bringing proceedings on the basis of sham contracting. And so the Fair Work Ombudsman released some figures last year which detailed uh, that in, in nine out of every ten cases it lodged uh, in the courts last year, uh, they wrote in or, or the, they, they brought in an accessory. So they weren't just going after the company, they were going after individuals uh, who, who were assisting the companies or the businesses in, in, in these sham contracting arrangements. So it's, it's quite important to be aware that the, the corporate bail in relation to sham contracting uh, is, is not a, a defence in many instances and individuals uh, will be brought before the courts uh, where, where, where the where FOIA decides or the Fair Work Ombudsman decides it's necessary to do so. Uh, probably one of the more topical uh, and interesting sham contracting uh, cases would have to be related to uh, Uber. The, the, the ride sharing business and uh, as far as I'm aware it's yet to uh, have been brought before the courts in Australia uh, and it may not be uh, brought before the courts in Australia as to whether this is a, a truly principal contractor arrangement or whether it is in fact uh, an employment relationship that's disguised as such. Uh, but in the UK uh, it, it was brought before the courts by two, by two young men who were, who were backed by an employee association. Uh, Mr. Aslam and Mr. Farah, who challenged Uber and alleged that uh, they weren't actually conducting their own business uh, in their, in, while they were doing the, while they were working for the ride-sharing company, uh, and that they should have, they were employees and they should have been entitled uh, specifically to to the entitlements as an employee, such as the minimum wage, uh, paid leave, paid paid breaks in some instances, and uh, this this case is, is really a an area that we're going to need to continue to watch over the next year or so because it was found uh, pretty, uh, very strongly by the, the Employment Tribunal in the UK that this was a relationship of employee, that the Uber drivers weren't running their own businesses, that they weren't contractors, that they were employees and that Uber was essentially uh, in a sham contracting arrangement with, with, with its drivers. And that's not to say that the same circumstances exist in Australia. Uh, but but it is something that uh, an area of law that will, will uh, inevitably be explored. And, and uh, I suppose in that case, I, I was initially surprised by the outcome because I, I suppose I didn't have a detailed understanding of the way in which Uber drivers were engaged and the, and the way in which they conducted their business. Uh, but having, having read the decision, they, uh, Uber was exerting a significant amount of control and, and that's what the court found. Uh, control over the way in which the drivers are doing things, how they did things, uh, you know, providing training and best practice guides, and, and there was a significant level um, of control in the way in which Uber uh, was engaging these people, which ultimately led to the decision uh, by, by the industrial tribunal that these people were actually employees and not contractors. Uber's appealed the decision, uh, and obviously their business model. Uh, likely depends on on these people who are driving their own cars, who are working any hours they choose, uh, being contractors, and so it's an interesting area uh, of law that's, that's that's taking place now in the UK, and, and there may be maybe the potential um, that companies like Uber, Uber in Australia, uh, could be before the court sooner or later, uh, while there's an assessment made over whether or not these uh, arrangements are contractual. Uh, or whether they should be regarded as employment relationships. Sorry, we've had a bit of a, a bump at the bottom. Let's get James to fix it up. Okay, I suppose uh, to conclude in, the, in relation to the, the, the presentation, uh, 
the protections, the protections um, exist against being forced into an independent contracting relationship. They're uh, under under the Queensland Act and, and the, the Federal Act, and presumably under each state's uh, Industrial Relations Act as well. Uh, if, if an employee or or someone who is potentially in one of these uh, sham contracting relationships does come to you as a, a CLC uh, volunteer or, or employee, uh, the, this presentation should have given you some of the areas that you might, or some of the indicators that you can look at to determine whether or not um, this may it may actually be a, a sham contracting arrangement or whether the contracting arrangement may be uh, uh, quite gen genuine. Uh, employees in these circumstances who have been sham contracts do have the right to recover um, their losses. Their losses can be quite broad. There's been examples of the courts uh, sending their decision to the taxation office uh, and, and to other offices. So uh, employees might um, do have an entitlement to claim and can claim those uh, benefits. And, and it might be including long service leave, uh, paid annual leave, personal leave days, there's a number of ways in which they can recover these lost entitlements, uh, and and also then some of the the Act does allow for people who have been engaged in a sham contracting arrangement uh, to have uh, a penalty paid to them in some instances, uh, although it's at the discretion of the courts. Uh, and obviously, to, to gain assistance in doing so, uh, people should attend the community legal service centre uh, or the Fair Work Ombudsman or uh, a legal advisor. So I don't know if we've got time for questions or if anyone has uh, any specific details that they'd like to be discussed. James is here now. Terrific. Uh, Brendan, thanks for that presentation. Um, a reminder, folks, that there are a couple of ways you can ask questions. You can type a question into the questions box on your control panel. You can press that button that looks like a hand. Brendan, we've been asked if it's found that a person has indeed been found to be engaged under a sham contract, how can that person go about recovering super? Uh, it would be done through the courts. Uh, so, the uh, I think each state would have has different superannuation legislation. Uh, it would be usually it would be a different um, application, uh, but it would be a matter of making a claim. So, so a small claim, a small claim tribunal or something like that would ordinarily be the forum in which you'd recommend uh, seeking that. Yes, uh, or otherwise it, it could be. Uh, what the courts have done in the last year or so, there's been a, a couple of instances where the judge has indicated in his decision that he'll be um, writing or, or sending his decision to certain departments or offices, and the tax office being one. So uh, it, it's really a matter of in your state how you, you do go about claiming that. And we uh, previously had a slide, a webinar from Michael Murray at Townsville Community Legal Service on recovering unpaid wages and thinking about the jurisdictions in which you can attempt to recover um, payments that are owed to you separately to flow kind of processes. Um, so that might be a starting resource for some of those people as well. Brent, we've been asked about the vicarious or associate liabilities of persons representing employers, such as human resources professionals. So the employer is being represented by a particular study. You, talk, you talked about associates being brought in, and that was the case in Juin, where a, an individual um, officer of the company was brought in. Um, is it limited to directors and shareholders? Could it be extended to people like HR? It has been extended to HR people before. So uh, HR people need to be aware, as do workplace lawyers, uh, of, of these arrangements and the fact that they could potentially be liable uh, under the Fair Work Act. So it's something that people need to be aware of uh, in, in their duties. So it's, it's not just the company that, that the ombudsman will um, proceed against. They quite often, in, in some instances, will, will go after individuals as well. Um, I think the answer on this is going to be it depends, but I'll ask the question anyway. What's the preferable venue for pursuing employee rights? The Fair Work Commission, the Federal Circuit Court, the Federal Court, some other forum, if you if you're not satisfied with the resolution that you've achieved through the Fair Work Ombudsman? Well, the, well, I suppose essentially you'd be hoping that the Fair Work Ombudsman brings the matter on your behalf. Otherwise, it would be the, the Federal Circuit Court uh, or the Federal Court. And I, I think there's different limits in each court. Uh, but probably the Federal Circuit Court would be the place to start. Uh, but it definitely wouldn't be the Fair Work Commission. They don't, they're not a court under the, the Constitution. They don't have the power uh, to even enforce their own decisions. So. Uh, 
for instance, if the, if the commission finds uh, an, a dismissal was unfair and awards someone twenty thousand dollars, they don't actually have the have their power to enforce that decision. It still could end up before the courts where someone challenges it. So uh, it, it's always going to be at the courts, and it'll be the, the federal circuit court would be the first court of call. Um, and my sense is for what it's worth that um, the Fair Work Ombudsman, like many of us, struggles to um, uh, deliver what it has to within the resource envelope that it has. And so there are probably community lawyers and other advocates out there that have um, attempted to bring a matter to the Fair Work Ombudsman's attention, but um, within their constraints haven't um, been able to get the, uh, convince the Ombudsman that they should um, bring uh, litigation or otherwise see it through, and so uh, those other forums that you've identified there, Chrissy, our questioner, um, are really important. I will say though that Julian and cases like it with Korean, largely Korean workers in cleaning large Sydney office buildings um, have absolutely come to the Fair Work Ombudsman attention, Fair Work Ombudsman's attention because these people have been to community legal centres and community legal centres have, oh, okay. have taken them up. That's interesting, I wasn't aware of that. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a comment here on a similar page, I guess, that uh, Flo is often referring back to community legal centres. I think that's not an uncommon experience. Um, if a settlement is reached, Brendan, via a mediation with Flo, which court can the person approach to enforce that agreement if the employer doesn't pay? Uh, it would be usually the federal court, uh, depending on the, the wording of the, the agreement. Sometimes these arrangements can uh, indicate a jurisdiction in which they might uh, be settled, but generally you expect to be the federal court. You mentioned, Brendan, that the ATO might have a role in collecting or enforcing the non-payment of super entitlements. Um, our question, I Chrissy, here is asked how active the ATO is in pursuing those debts for employees that were in these sham contracting arrangements. I, I'm not sure. I mean, the majority of the work I do is in employment law, uh, and so we don't, I, I wouldn't be able to definitely say for sure. I did notice, um, obviously a decision I was reading recently where the, the federal court judge, I think it was Anna Katzen, although don't hold me to that, may have indicated that she was going to uh, send her decision directly to the ATO so that uh, the different areas, and I don't think the ATO is the place necessarily for superannuation um, enforcement, but in the different areas uh, or, or entitlements that employees have um, lost and the, and the employers have gained by uh, entering into these sham arrangements can, can uh, are essentially covered by different bodies, uh, and so quite often they, even though a decision might be found in relation to uh, an employee's entitlement, and they might receive back pay, the ACO will never find out that uh, this arrangement's been going on for, for five years, and, and so I think mean, they're trying to work out um, how that they can, uh, I, I guess, bring a decision across all the jurisdictions, uh, and, and I don't know if there's necessarily an answer yet. A reminder, folks, there are a couple of ways you can ask questions and we can probably take another one or two. Um, you can press a bu that button that looks like a hand and we'll see your hand go up and we can unmute the microphone. The other way is to type a question into the questions box. Um, can I ask, um, Brendan, in your experience and in the cases that you've read around this stuff, you mentioned the role of unions in some of this. So I suspect that most of the people who are working under these sham employment arrangements as ostensibly independent contractors are rarely members of unions and often won't have access to the support of a union? I think it's specifically it would be industry dependent. Uh, you know, the building industry, there, there is a lot of contracting in the building industry and, you know, we're, we're of course to look at those relationships and, uh, between the, the independent contractors in that industry. Uh, they, they might determine they were employees. So I, I think that's a, that can be a generalisation. Obviously, the difference between tradesmen in that industry is that they're generally in pretty good conditions, and so there won't be areas, there won't be issues relating to underpayment, uh, and they're not necessarily vulnerable in the same way uh, that we see in other industries. Uh, and, and so, back, back, going back to your question, was can they be members of unions? I, I, I believe an independent contractor can be, uh, uh, or, or at least an association. And so can employees of uh, community legal centres, uh, so the service union is our union, so I'll just put that little plug in there. Question here, um, Brendan, can an employee recover their legal costs they initiate proceedings in the federal court for a sham contracting claim? Ordinary cost rules of the federal circuit court will apply in? Yes. Yep. Uh, so they can, they may not get them all back, um, 
depending on how much their lawyers cost and, and what their fees are. But no different to any other no, uh, jurisdiction right. for the federal circuit. That's right. Um, how do you determine the loss to the employee is a question that's come through. Is the contract price treated as gross pay or net pay? And how would PAYG then be dealt with if it's not being deducted in the sharing contracting arrangement? It, it can be quite complicated. Yeah. Uh, it would obviously depend on, uh, in many instances, the individual like, uh, arrangement between the, the sham contractee uh, and the sham contractor. So uh, it, it quite often uh, the, these contracts might have offset clauses in them, uh, which will seek to limit uh, an employer's or a, a principal's liability in circumstances where the relationship was determined to be uh, an employment relationship. Uh, so there's no specific way. In, in relation to PAYG, I'm just not sure uh, because it's a matter of the, 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 the federal court quite often won't make a ruling in relation um, to, to, to tax when they're looking at these unpaid entitlements. And, and so it's, all, it's almost as though we don't, there isn't necessarily a way in which it's all being brought together at once at the moment. Uh, so, so I'm not sure specifically about PAYG and how it's treated. Brendan, I think that's the questions that have come through so far. We'll email around, as I said before, folks, uh, links to the recording, touch wood, and uh, possibly even Brendan's contact details. I'm putting him on the spot here in case there are any other um, queries that come through. Can I, on behalf of people clapping and cheering wildly at computers across the country, thank Brendan for um, a very thoughtful and um, uh, relevant presentation for Community Legal Centre staff. Um, Thank you all for tuning in and um, paying such close attention. It is an important area of our practice. Uh, and thanks to those of you that are starting to send through thank you messages to Brendan as well. We'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Have a great day. Uh, thanks a lot.